Hello and welcome back to another episode of Goodness Love Alive. Today we're talking to Dr. Natasha Falahi to talk about autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's and the mysterious mind-body connection. Let's dive in. (laughs) Dr. Natasha Falahi, it's so great to be with you today talking all about the mind-body approach to treating Hashimoto's. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, both of you. It's really great to talk with you. Awesome. Before we get into the nitty-gritty, I'd love to hear more from you because I think it's quite an interesting approach when we're talking about the mind's impact on our wellness and on autoimmune disease. So how did you get into this whole realm of approaching medicine? Um, Well, it really started with my own personal healing journey. Um, I always say I never set out to be a doctor, even though that's what my parents wanted. And I was kind of pressured to do that. Um, I really resisted it. I was very drawn to the arts and I pursued that. So I was in art school Um, And I had always had these kind of consistent underlying health issues my whole life. I was kind of like a weak, delicate child. I would get sick a lot. I would get strep throat every year. Um, I got chicken pox like two or three times when I was a kid. And I just thought, okay, I'm just delicate. I'm just weak. Um, I have, you know, a weak immune system. And that just became part of my understanding of who I was. And so as I was growing up, um, you know, I I had bouts of depression and anxiety. And again, I thought, well, this is just my artistic nature. This is just kind of um, who I am. I like to sleep a lot. I'll sleep like past noon, um, stay up late. And this is my personality. Um, That kind of kept increasing and increasing. And then it was an, an undergrad for me. So it was like probably 19 or 20 when I really hit rock bottom. Like this was when everything kind of built up so bad that my anxiety became debilitating. I was starting to have panic attacks in public. I would have to like run out of the subway system and like vomit in the closest store or, um, I couldn't go to class. I couldn't function much anymore. And the depression started to become overwhelming where it was interfering with my ability to do anything. Um, and it was at that point that I sort of started seeking, answers. I would start going to doctor after doctor saying like, there's something wrong with me. What is it? Um, and this is kind of a very common story that I think a lot of people unfortunately know where they, they're, they're looking for deeper answers. They're looking kind of for a root cause of what's going on with them. And they'll often go to specialists after specialists and often are told they're making it up. Things are in their head. They should take antidepressants. Um, I was offered, you know, antidepressants, anti-anxieties and, and birth control, just like, just like that without testing anything because it was probably that things were imbalanced or that I was just making this up and I needed to kind of calm down my mind around it. Um, I didn't really accept that as the answer. So in my early twenties is when I, started like seeing all kinds of specialists. And I actually walked into my first chiropractor's office and she was very holistically minded. So she looked at the body, um, not just physically, but also chemically and mentally and emotionally. So she did a full exam. And I have to say, this was probably the first practitioner that I went to who actually listened to me. She sat me down, did a one or two hour intake and like asked me questions about everything, about what I ate, my childhood, my menstrual cycle. And I was happy that somebody was just listening to me at this point. Um, she did her exam. She took x-rays of my, my skeletal structure and my posture and came back and reported to me. It was just like, she was like, you know, wow, I totally imagine that you're suffering and you're like, you must feel really terrible because you're probably operating at 10% of your potential. And that was my first indication that life could be better than what I had been experiencing. So in that realm, in that path, she started working with me holistically and she started working with me mostly in my body, in this kind of mind body aspect where we were really focusing on my nervous system and how well it was communicating my brain and my body, how well my body was aligned. Um, 
and in that process, she was trickling in ideas about my diet. Like, what am I eating? I should maybe eat more vegetables and shop on the periphery of the grocery store instead of down the aisles. And it was this process that really became life changing for me because that's not really the, the kind of care or narrative that you're given when you're, when you go and you ask for help, especially for insidious or chronic conditions. So having that experience with her, um, you know, a couple months into that process of getting my adjustments, getting energy work, um, through a technique that she was doing, working with, um, a therapist who she referred me to, who also was doing energy work, my depression and anxiety actually started to resolve and lift. I started to have the first moments of joy and happiness. Um, it would go away like within a couple seconds or a couple minutes, but I started to get these glimpses of like, wow, I'm, I'm think I'm feeling better. Like I'm in, I'm seeing these small improvements over time. And this was really by focusing on my body and the way my mind was connecting to my body through the body work, the adjustments and through the mind body energy medicine that we were doing. So, um, you know, that was like my personal story that happened over a decade ago. And it was so profound and life changing for me that after I continued to approve that path, I, I changed my whole career. <laughs> I changed my whole path in life to go get my doctorate and study this to, to really understand mind body medicine. Um, at the time while I was working with her, I didn't know that I had Hashimoto's and I didn't know that, um, these, all these things that were, I was experiencing were like, effects of an autoimmune process going on. Um, but when I found that out later and I looked back on it, I realized how much the, the mind body medicine that I was receiving at the time, not only it helped me feel better and like stopped or, you know, um, relieved of the symptoms that I was feeling, but actually started to reverse the process of what was going on with my autoimmune reactivity. So, I mean, long story short, it was really just because I had this amazing, like healing experience myself that I, I decided to go become a doctor, learn these things. And in that process, um, really got interested in immunology and neurology and the way that all of that fits together. Um, but how we can access that through the body and through the mind. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And it's so yeah. cool to hear that, that like, you know, part of your journey was pain, but it's been turned into something so amazing that you're able to now treat and help people which um, I'd love to hear more about how this all works. Um, and for the uninitiated in our audience, could you just explain to us a little about autoimmune disease and Hashimoto's and why it occurs? And let's just start there first. Well, that's yeah, a good absolutely. question I in itself. Kind of, but yeah. I dove into the deep end there a little bit just talking about it. Um, but, you know, so I right now, am, I, I work with mind-body medicine and um, I mostly work with highly sensitive people, um, generally women, and they may or may not know that they have an autoimmune diagnosis or there's any sort of autoimmunity or Hashimoto's going on. Essentially what that is, is when our body for many reasons, which we can get into becomes dysregulated, our immune system becomes dysregulated. Um, and it sort of, you know, for lack of a better term gets confused and starts tagging some of our own tissue as non-self. So there's parts of our immune system that are responsible for going out and looking for invaders, like distinguishing friend from foe. And generally what it's looking for is pathogens or you know different bacteria, debris that shouldn't be in our internal environment. And what it does is it tags those um, invaders with these antibody flags. And then there's another part of our immune system whose job is to kind of just go out and indiscriminately kill the bad guys, kill like the bacteria, the pathogens, the viruses, the foes, right? Um, but they, they're different departments. They don't communicate well with each other. So what happens with autoimmune disease is that the part of the immune system that's responsible for putting the flags down and saying, hey, this is non-self, this is a foe, will go and, you know, tag pathogens or whatnot, but then it will start putting ta flags or antibodies on our own tissue. So Hashimoto's, for example, is having a flag or an antibody to your own thyroid tissue. Um, but all autoimmune diseases are kind of um, named based on the target tissue that they're affecting. So if you have flags placed 
by your immune system on your joints, it's called rheumatoid arthritis. Um, if it's on your myelin sheath of the nervous system, it's multiple sclerosis. But underlying all these different autoimmune conditions is that dysregulation of our immune system. And the reason why that's tricky is because the immune, um, you know, marker or the immune guys whose job it is to put the flags down, they're not communicating with the guys who are just going out there to like clear house, right? They, those guys just go out when there's inflammation, there's a signal to go take care of the bad guys. They just go out and they look for flags and indiscriminately destroy. So that's good when we have a cold or um, a flu or, you know, we're fighting some sort of infection. It's not good when the flags are on our own tissue because then we have friendly fire. Um, and so that's what an autoimmune reaction is um, in a metaphoric sort of way is our immune system has this miscommunication, this dysregulation of determining what's uh, self and non-self and then having an inflammatory attack on our own tissue. Well said. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So speaking of mind body medicine, what do you think is the impact of our mind on this autoimmune process? If there is a connection? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a lot of the, you know, the stuff that I'm talking about, a lot of it comes from traditional medicine. So when you look at things like traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine, there's these practices that incorporate not just, you know, our biochemical um, health or our physical health, but also our mental emotional health. Um, but now, you know, also in Western medicine and the things that they're studying now, there's fields, you know, one of the broad fields that looks into this is called psychoneuroimmunology. So it's really talking about um, how think like our thoughts that we have impact our nervous system, which then impacts our immune system or endocrinology as well. So for example, when, you know, this idea of stress often is thrown around, but stress has very real tangible physiological impacts. Um, it, a lot of specific hormones are released. Um, we, we go into a more inflammatory state. So when somebody's upset, when they're stressed, um, the chemistry in our body is different than when we're relaxed or we're feeling joy or we're curious and we're exploring. So that field of psychoneuroimmunology um, in you know Western medicine is really looking at how our mind can actually start to shift things that happen in our body and vice versa. When we have a negative experience in our body, it can create loops of stuff that impact the way we experience things in our mind. Um, and, you know, one example of that, that, you know, is very, um, physical and tangible is like the microbiome and how they're really starting to understand that when the bugs in our guts are impacting like the, the, the communication to our brain and those neurotransmitters. So people who have um, imbalances in their guts will start having ex different experiences around anxiety or depression um, or in like neuroinflammation as well. So it's all connected. It's, you know, a two way street, but we, we look at things holistically in that there's the, the physical body, there's the biochemistry that's happening inside of it. And then there's that mental emotional experience that we're having. And any one of those will impact every other realm. Excellent. So, um, looking at specifically Hashimoto's, mm -hmm. um, what, um, what are some mind body things that people may be missing? Maybe they've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's and yeah. the doctor's saying you've, you've got Hashimoto's, um, and they're on some form of either it's a functional plan or it's a, some form of medication. What are some things that they may be missing from this mind body connection that you've discovered to specifically treat Hashimoto's? Yeah. So what I've noticed in, you know, my experience with Hashimoto's and that autoimmune reactivity, but also with a lot of people who I work with, um, there's this very common characteristic for people who have autoimmune reactivity to be highly sensitive. So whether they're really like empathic and they're, you know, they're, they're highly sensitive empaths or they're highly sensitive people. They react really strongly to stimulus in their environment, like really bright lights or loud sounds or strong um, chemicals, you know, so a perfume might smell good to, to somebody. And then generally what I find is people with Hashimoto's or autoimmune reactivity are like really nauseated and put off by some of those smells. Um, so that's one thing that, you know, 
is partially physiological. Um, we can explain that in the understanding of how it, when somebody's like under a chronic inflammatory state, stimulus like light and sounds um, can aggravate the nervous system a little bit more, but also there's a burden on toxic overload and the liver and the ability to get rid of toxins. But we can also look at it from a mental emotional place where because these people are so highly sensitive, they're picking up so much from their environment around them that they carry those burdens and then it causes more stress in their body. So it becomes this vicious cycle where when you're already a sensitive person. So I've noticed that particularly people with Hashimoto's, they tend to be really sensitive to their environment. Um, they often like whether it's a chicken, chicken or the egg situation, they tend to be very, um, kind of like perfectionistic or even high strung or whatever. And part of that is because they've had this experience their whole life where they're so sensitive, they're reacting to smells or sounds or sensory things in their environment that they try to control that. So they have a, a more easeful experience. Um, but in that it can create a lot of like perfectionism in that environment or trying to like control the way the things around their house or in their family is run because they're the ones that feel the effects of things being off first. Um, so these are things that, again, like I said, can be a chicken or the egg. So when you, when I work with someone, um, we kind of explore how that mind body stuff works. Like when we start to create more ease in the body, we start to experience more ease in the brain, um, and in the mind and the, that mental experience. And vice versa, when we experience more ease in our mental, emotional space, the body also starts to follow suit. I think that's so important. I think the mind has such a, it's a master controller of our, our body. And if we're not having good thoughts or it's going to show up in our body. And I can definitely speak from the sensitive person's perspective. That's me. I, I think we're a bit kindred here. Um, <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll tell you, we, uh, personally, my health went down the toilet when I had a family crisis. And if I, I looking back, it's so clear in my timeline mm -hmm. that that's when, you know, I was always a sensitive person, but then I had quite a significant family crisis. And then that's when I went into this autoimmune picture. I was sore and depressed. And, um, and I think that was, yeah, anyway. So I resonate personally with what you're saying. So when you're working with your clients, mm -hmm. how do you help them? Um, I guess process this trauma or it's not, it's not like we want to turn off empathy, right? right. <laughs> so I'll like how, how do we learn to manage this sensitivity or our emotions in this healing process? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, that's something that I, I felt the same way. It was like, I don't want to become a less sensitive person. Cause I think that that's actually something that adds to my experience in life. It adds to my creativity and that ability to be introspective and, and connect with others, like be able to feel what they're feeling. So a lot of it is kind of exploring a lot of times if there was a triggering event that caused, um, you know, a kind of an overwhelm for the person. So a lot of times there is a traumatic event. Um, and when I talk about trauma with people, um, there's maybe a slightly different definition that we're used to hearing. So um, and this is one of the topics that I think is really important to get into with mind body medicine is talking about trauma, but trauma often, the first thing we think of is something really major, like a car accident or like falling off of a horse and hitting our head or even larger traumas, like maybe societal traumas or like they're like people who come from war torn countries or things like that. Those are all very obvious to us. Right. And there are these big events. Um, so if you think about it on this spectrum or actually a quadrant, um, that's what I would call kind of an objective trauma. It's like across the board, everyone goes, okay, that's a really difficult situation. It would be really traumatic. It's very overwhelming. Right. But if you go down that spectrum to the subjective side, there are things that can be traumatic to a person that are more subjective. And I find that people who are initially already more like empathetic and highly sensitive experience a lot more of those subjective traumas. So an example of that was when I was growing up. Um, so, you know, I'm first generation American. I had immigrant parents and we had different like food and, and cultural traditions. So I took, you know, one of my cultural meals to school one day 
and it smelled and looked different than the other kids' meals. And they laughed at me and they, you know, like pointed and, and made fun of me as a five-year-old in kindergarten. And that was incredibly traumatic to me, right? And I think a lot of people can relate and understand, but granted, it's not a big car accident, right? It's something that was very subjectively traumatic. So the idea of trauma, to step back a little bit and define it, is really a concept of an overwhelm of information. So really that information is not good or bad. It's like something happens and we weren't expecting it. We weren't aware of how to handle it. We didn't have those tools, right? So with the trauma, um, for something to remain and, and start and continue causing like chronic issues for a person is when a, a big event like that happens, an overwhelm of information where we didn't have the tools, we didn't know how to file that in our system of how the world works. Um, and we didn't have the tools to just move forward with that. We end up not processing it, not integrating it. So wherever that information is stored in our mind body field, we kind of have to like separate ourselves from it. Like we kind of are like, okay, that pain in my chest or that like lump in my throat where I couldn't like communicate back to these kids or I felt embarrassed or I lost someone and it hurt so deep in my heart. We end up kind of building a wall around it and separating it so that we can kind of move forward, right? It's a survival mechanism. And so what happens is the way that becomes, that plays into chronic illness is that we start to disconnect from that area of our body because it uses mental resources and it, you know, for us to always like tap into that, we kind of just like disconnect. So when we talk about the energy fields and the mind body, when we have a disconnect, right, we're not nourishing that part of our body. It's not receiving nutrients and love and, and all those things that we need. And it's also not being cleared out of all the, the toxic junk, right? And that can happen on this emotional level where it's like my emotional heart. But if we're also kind of avoiding mentally, we've like sectioned off that part of our body, our biochemistry is going to listen to that too, you know? And so there's this connection between having that emotional overwhelm where we've disconnected and then somebody who's sensitive has lots of these disconnects all over their body, right? They're fragmented. So that is how I work with people when we start to explore the idea of traumas that have contributed to their health, where they've become disconnected from their body. And when we're talking about a past traumatic situation like that, um, we go back and we, we look at it. Sometimes we have conversations with ourselves in that past um, person that we were. We, we communicate with that person and, you know, really try to empathize and understand like you did the best that you could with the resources that you had and with what you understood at the time. So sometimes it's about forgiving ourselves for the way that we acted in a traumatic situation or in a past situation. Sometimes it's about forgiving another person, even if we don't rebuild a relationship with them or accept what happened, really just having compassion and understanding for it. So that's one way we start to break free from those disconnects that we have um, from a mind-body perspective. And then we become more connected to ourselves because that's really where a lot of this mind-body um, connection comes with chronic illness is we're so disconnected from our, our innate like abilities to understand things and our innate wisdom. So once we start to open that up, the body has much more access to our own healing powers and, um, the energy flows better and we're able to make healthier decisions for ourselves rather than just like cyclical patterns of stuff that we sometimes get stuck in from, kind of that mental emotional place awesome this is so fascinating to me like i love this conversation because obviously from a western perspective in science we've almost be, we've almost rejected this aspect of our the nature of ourselves because of i guess it was abused in the past or it's you know western science is built on a certain way of rationalism which has been great and has led us to this point yeah. But now the interesting thing is that science has also discovered all these weird aspects of human nature, energy, and it doesn't really know what to do with it. So uh, that's I've been reading about this stuff for years. So and I, I find it personally really helpful. So I'm curious if we just go back down into um, autoimmune disease and Hashimoto's, mm -hmm. what is happening on an energetic level that you've noticed in your clients or that you've studied um, specifically right. when someone's suffering with this? And what does it look like from an energy perspective? Yeah. So one of the techniques that I practice really looks at 
um, like the energy forms in our body. So, you know, we have our physical body and um, some people may be familiar with the idea of having energy bodies too. Like sometimes they're called aura, sometimes they're called chakras. Um, even Chinese medicine has the name for meridians that exists in Ayurvedic medicine too. So there are these ways that it has been tracked through thousands of years of history where there's energy flowing through our body that in Western medicine, we haven't necessarily invented the instrument that's looking at it or reading it or measuring it. Right. But there are um, ways of using like touch therapy or in our mind accessing that. And, and if, you know, we imagine that we have this energy field around our body, people with Hashimoto's um, in particular and autoimmune disease, when I work with them, we look at how expansive those energy fields are in the different centers of their body. And what I found um, that was so fascinating to me because it wasn't being taught in this way in regards to autoimmune, but I noticed this pattern was the people who hold um, their bodies sort of cinched. Like imagine if we took a belt and we wrapped it around my head and that was a big energy field and we sort of just cinched it or like around my chest. Um, if we think about somebody energetically like that, they're cinched. They're kind of trying to take up less space in this world. They don't feel worthy. They don't feel like they deserve to be in this world. So when we look, when I look at somebody from energetic perspective, I'm looking at how their body's being held. Is it voluminous and full and they're, you know, fulfilling their full body and their energy space? Or are they pulling in? Are they cinched? Are they tight? Um, some people who are really somatically oriented might understand what I'm saying. Like when they look at themselves in the mirror, they look at other people. But it became fascinating to me because that idea of the cinched energy really correlates with this idea of an autoimmune dysregulated attack. Because there's kind of this philosophical idea of like, why would your immune system attack your own body, right? In Western medicine, they go, okay, this just happens. It's, you know, it's a dysregulation, it's a toxin or whatever. There are all these explanations to it, right? But if we think about it from a mind-body perspective, if somebody does not feel worthy, they don't feel like they belong, um, they, they feel like they're imposing on other people, they don't have that sense of, self-worth, self-confidence, um, they're going to try to shrink, right? Like that's a metaphor we use. You don't, don't shrink around other people. That's a metaphor that we use, but that can happen energetically for people. And that in is of itself is a physical way that we're self-destructive, right? Which is this immune way of being self-destructive with autoimmune disease. So what I find is that when I work with people and we are able to tap into them feeling their own energy fields, and breathing into it more and like releasing those cinched belts and they take up more space, their immune systems calm down and they, they have less inflammation. There's less of that autoimmune attack on themselves. And I, I noticed this in my own mind too. Like you, um, one of the examples that I knew I always did was like, I was a very engaged student. Um, I was a rebellious student, but I was still engaged. I was very curious. I wasn't by the book, but I would ask a lot of questions. I would engage a lot. And once I was being taught this, and I, I was the student that would always raise my hand. And when I was called on, I would say, I'm sorry. And then I would ask my question as if like, I'm sorry to bother you. I'm sorry to take up space. And I was always, you know, almost like um, approached by other people after a class or whatever, saying, thanks for asking that question. I, you know, I was thinking of that too, or that was really helpful for me. But internally, I had this dialogue around like my voice was not worthy to really take up the classroom's time. And I noticed that every time I raised my hand, I go, sorry, da, 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 da. And then I'd ask my question. And it was just programmed, right? Those are the mind body things, those patterns we have um, that we don't even realize that we're, we, we don't feel worthy of taking up space or, you know, talking to other people. Um, and so, that's a big part of it is really becoming aware of these unconscious things we do that are putting ourselves down or, or even just clues to the fact that maybe, you know, I, I could appear very confident, but the fact that I really didn't feel that my voice deserved to be heard is, is a bigger indication of what's going on internally for me. So it's a lot of that, like really digging into a person's narrative um, and really getting to know them to see at what points they have 
um, expressed themselves in their purpose in their in their own life and and in what areas maybe they were overwhelmed or shut down or their their mindset shifted at some point um, that is then over the years reflected in their biochemistry. So mm. would you believe then that um, I'd be curious as to some of the case studies of people that you've looked at once we've once you've done this work with someone maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, have you seen what comes first sometimes? Like, is it work, looking at the diet and looking at obviously working through a, an, a doctor like yourself? Um, or have you found weirdly that by adjusting their body and adjusting and looking at this, this actual bioengenetic work, that you've actually able to have a massive breakthrough with the actual condition you're looking at? Yeah, that's an awesome question. And um, it's really fascinating to me because I'm, I'm, I find I get more breakthroughs when we focus more on the body work, the mind body medicine, like really digging into somebody's narrative, um, more so. So, um, so I have, I have so many stories to tell about this. Um, like, but for example, like so many times, and I can think of one lovely patient that I had in particular, um, but we were working through lots of things. I mean, she had, had, she had the perfect autoimmune paleo diet or the autoimmune protocol diet. She'd been doing it for years done all the supplements and still just was like having these major barriers to her own healing. It was just plateaued. Um, and we really focused a lot on all of it. We did functional medicine testing, but she would consistently come in, um, once a week and we would do body work and energy work. And, um, it really becomes this process where I'm, I'm not doing it to them. I'm helping them reconnect to their own body. So it's a lot, it's this guided process, um, where, really it's about helping someone find their way back to their own intuition. Um, because then she became so advanced in this process that she started to know when her body was out of whack or when she needed another adjustment or, um, but that's kind of the process. And, you know, there was one particular day where I adjusted her and, um, you know, we started doing work both on the physical body, the posture, but also like the emotional centers in the body. And, um, this happens so much, but like immediately during that adjustment, the person might just like start bawling and like releasing this whole overwhelm of emotion. Or I've had other people tell me like, Whoa, I just had a a memory flash of something. Maybe it was an ex-boyfriend or like a place that I traveled a long time ago or something. And they have this release. And, um, sometimes they tell me when they go home, they, they just like journal a lot they have kind of a release and then they feel lighter and they feel more free. Um, and so those are my favorite kind of ways of going about it, partially because that was also my, um, journey through it. I started through the body, through the energy medicine, and then I started exploring the diets, the supplements, the functional medicine testing. But, um, I I think that there's so much of that, which is so valuable, but I, I really don't see a lot of people, connecting this other side of healing, um, it's particularly for autoimmune and Hashimoto's people. And, and this is, you know, a lot what I talk about where they're really stuck in their energy fields, both in their throat chakras, in their pelvic areas, which is our sense of stability and, and grounding and roots in the world. Um, and so when we're able to realign all that, improve someone's posture, um, and have them feel more at home in their body, all of a sudden, their immune system starts to shift and their mental and emotional state. Like I told you, I I was dealing with massive anxiety and depression. One of the benefits I noticed right off the bat was like within a couple weeks of doing this kind of work, my depression and anxiety lifted. Like at that point, I, I didn't change my diet. I was still eating like macaroni and cheese and pizza every day. Like it wasn't it, and those things I needed to change to continue on my healing journey. But for many years, it was just the body work that started to like bring that out um, for me again. So I think that I, I can just think of so many examples where people have this like release. Sometimes it's with body work. Sometimes it's with virtual coaching. And, and we just sit there and we talk about their story and I help them look at it and I help them find um, a new meaning, a new understanding in their story and that shift in and of itself can be like a turning point for them because they have more compassion. They have more sense of themselves in this world. So cool. So Dr. Natasha, for our listeners at home, mm-hmm. is there anything, um, say they're listening to you and they really are 
resonating what, with what you're saying. They're like, oh, I've been working so much on my diet and I'm not getting where I want to. And, and I'm feeling like this emotional side of things, this mental side of things is something that I need to lean into. Is there anything that you could recommend to them that they could start today? Just uh, uh, what's, uh, uh, what are some practices that you would recommend to someone that wants to make a start? On yeah, this sort, of, sort of thing. Definitely. So um, there's a couple of really simple things that I would recommend that I even tried myself, but I work with my patient. Um, one, you know, again, because particularly talking about the throat chakra and the thyroid and like having this sense of communication and creativity, um, there's a practice that comes from, I think it's called the artist's way. It's like a, a, a journal to help with like opening your artistic path. Um, she has this exercise called the morning pages, which a lot of times I'll just adapt somehow and I'll have my clients do, but that is really about, if possible, first thing in the morning when you wake up, set aside some time for yourself and just write like three to five pages of just streaming. Like don't edit yourself, don't try to like have it mean anything or even look at it later or show anyone. Um, And this is really important because at that moment in the day we're transitioning from that um, subconscious realm of sleep and kind of all the stuff we are processing and holding on to. And it helps clear the way for us to have more of a connection with our innate voice and our creativity throughout the day. Um, and so if we're able to kind of dump that, we can then have a little bit more clarity as we move through the day. So that's a really simple, um, but powerful way of, clearing out some of the other junk that's clouding us and getting back to, um, you know, more of what our true inner voice is asking us for or telling us um, that's really helpful. And sometimes I end the day or, or, you know, I did this practice myself when I was in the depths of depression, but I would start a little journal. And I know people talk about like a gratitude journal or, um, you know, write what you're grateful for, you know, try to put down these little facts. And sometimes I think people struggle with that because when they're really feeling so terrible, it's, it's sometimes hard to access that. That's the goal, right? We want to get to gratitude and we want to get to joy and compassion. So what I did instead, um, myself, but now I coach people to do is if you can end your day with an emotion that you want to feel more of. So to like, it could be joy. It could be like humor. It could be any of these things. Um, just make a list and say today was blank. Because um, when I was at my worst, it was just like today was great because that's all I could think of. It was like, why was today great? Right. Um, And if you can only write down one thing, only write down one thing. But my list started with things like I did my laundry today because that was a big feat for me. Or, um, you know, I chose salad instead of French fries. And that was enough for me to like feel a little bit proud of enough to write in this little journal and What's really amazing about that, especially if you end your day with it, is subconsciously you start to kind of look for things that will fit into that description. Um, So once, you know, I wanted to have more humor in my life. So I was like, today was funny because and I would do this and, and, and then I would start to like look for. And in some ways we start to subconsciously create that experience, because when we really start to understand the power of our mind body and the power of our intuition, we really can manifest and create a lot of things in our life and for others. Um, We just have to focus our intention there. So when we're focusing our intention on joy or humor or something that we want more of in our life, subconsciously we're going to either create it or look for it rather than look for the things that are wrong, even if it's just to write it down in that little journal at the end of the night. It's so cool. It's um, I think I've seen a study actually of people that are exp- those that are actually practice that this journaling technique. Actually, it's a way of boosting your serotonin. Have you seen? Yeah, that? absolutely, totally. Um, I have seen those studies. There's a lot of like, especially in the psychological realm of uh, medicine and um, psychology, and um, you know where they look at just the mental states. They do a lot of studies on that, like ways that when we do these different things, we can affect our serotonin levels or dopamine levels. Um, and it's really, it is very powerful. It's not just kind of like this trivial, like, okay, journaling is not going to do anything for me. I'm not a writer to begin with. Um, it has to do with the way that it frames the rest of our day and the way that our, our brain starts to react to that. So yeah, absolutely. 
I, I purchased the journal, but Sarah laughed at me. When uh, I it. Sorry, that wasn't very supportive of me, was it? Was it? But it was this very adorable journal. I don't know. Now I feel bad. Now you know the science, babe. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> to find whatever thing is easy for you to do. So some people, I mean, I was doing it on like a crappy notepad and I was doing it as bullet points because I was like, that's manageable for me. Um, and I wasn't doing it to like have it polished. But some, I don't know, I've seen ones where there's apps. People can do a five minute app at the end of the day if that's easier for you. Just something that, you know, you feel there isn't much of a, a barrier for you to get into. Um, even, you know, some people, if you want to just like record a little thing on your phone and just leave it at that, and keep it in, in an album for yourself. Um, something that that is your style of communication. Um, but journaling is, is helpful. It gives us that moment to sit down and connect with our own hand in the paper. Um, so it gives us a little of a somatic experience too. Love it. It's, um, I, I, I can reflect on one story for me in particular. I had this, I was really burnt out with work. Um, it was before I actually knew a lot about this sort of stuff. Uh-huh. Um, and we got on a flight and I had this horrific, unfortunately it was like a 14 hour flight. And I had this horrific panic attack loop that my brain was going in. I was sweating. I couldn't calm myself down. And this is coming from someone that wanted to maybe be a pilot growing up. I loved getting on airplanes. And what yeah. I found that was really interesting in trying to heal this for me at a subconscious level is that consciously I still love flying, mm-hmm. but subconsciously there's that trauma from that 14 hour nonstop loop. I just wanted to get off the plane. I was, couldn't control my thoughts properly. I was just sweating profusely. Um, it was obviously resulting from burnout. Can you explain as to why someone like, someone like myself now, I walk on a plane and I start having some of those symptoms again at a subconscious level. Consciously I'm like, I can't yeah. wait to fly this X, Y, Z destination. Um, is that an example of something where you're carrying this sort of negative energy within your body that's reacting to a stimulus, even though my conscious mind is absolutely fine? Yeah, absolutely. And um, a lot of times, you know, when we have a sort of reaction like that, like we have as humans, like a negativity bias, right? We want, like, we want to survive. We want to watch out for things that can be dangerous for us. But n- nowadays, um, as particularly with, you know, all the stimulus that we have around us, um, we sometimes can see things as a threat that, at, you know, the threat might pass really quickly, but like physiologically, we're used to when we, when we see a threat, having a deep imprinted memory of that, because we don't want to come across that threat and then just be like, oh, this is new, because it's really important for our nervous system to remember those things that are threatening, right? Um, and this can happen with something that's like, um, you know, in a situation like that, like where you had a negative experience on a plane and then you're just like, that's part of this anxiety attack thing where people get anxious about having another anxiety attack. Um, and so that happens a lot. Um, and you know, they, they have, they've done a lot of studies about this. I think one of the ways you can think about it too, is how there's kind of a switch in our nervous system from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic, um, nervous system. Those are the, our autonomic, autonomic nervous systems. And the sympathetic one is the fight, flight, freeze. Right. Um, and so that's the kind of experience you're having when you've locked in an emotional trauma or, um, something that's like causing anxiety. And the goal is to switch that off so that we can be in a parasympathetic state, which is rest and digest. Um, but sometimes that's really hard to, I mean, it's sometimes impossible to do just consciously where we're just like, okay, this shouldn't be scary and turn it off because our, our nervous systems are very smart. It was at some point it served us for some reason. Um, and generally there was some connection or some reason that your brain made meaning out of that being a threatening situation. Right. So part of doing that trauma work, um, and this is kind of what I talked about. It's really important to know the person's story and kind of dig into where the root of that initial, response was because that's where our body is very like understandably holding on to a threat of something that could be dangerous for us. Right. So, um, there are ways and whether it's through breath work or actually body works a really powerful one too, or energy releasing of that mental state. Um, but to kind of, you know, set yourself in a situation where it allows your nervous system to know that that isn't threatening. Like it was adaptive at the time, but it's not helpful to hold on to that threat as you move forward. Um, and this comes up a lot too, with like, 
um, couples, for example, like, you know, the, the Gottman Institute, they do a lot of research on like couples and like success in terms of like whether they stay together or they separate after a certain number of years. And they find the same sort of anxiety response in couples that have had stressful situations and not kind of resolved it. So what happens is when one of them walks in the room or when they're near each other, they start having a sympathetic response. Their heart rate increases. Um, they release the stress hormones, um, all, you know, all of those kind of fight or flight response. And they find that when you're able, even as a couple or in a situation, if you think about yourself individually and something that you have anxiety around to work through that, create meaning through it and, um, understand like, subconsciously how that threat has passed and create a new sense of meaning around it. That's um, where the sympathetic state turns off. Um, there's ways of doing this without at consciously like thinking about it. Some of those things include like body work, like we talked about energy releasing, um, even doing like vagal nerve stimulation. All these things will actually start to shift the nervous system into that calmed parasympathetic state. And then you connect it to that experience. Great. Thank you. For those who aren't familiar with the, uh, the vagus nerve, could mm -hmm. you talk a, just a little bit about that and what you mean when you say vagal nerve stimulation? Um, so this is, you know, a lot of this comes from the work of my husband, who I think you're going to talk to soon because he's the yes. brain expert. Okay, but, we'll, um, we'll save much, most of this. Yeah, then, most of it. But, um, but it is really powerful. It is because um, it's one of the ways that you can non-invasively activate that. So it's a nerve that, um, travels with the, the wanderer and it, ha it ha can have really significant impacts on our emotional experiences. So people who have anxiety, insomnia, um, you know, those kinds of feelings, if they do things to activate the vagus nerve, it will pretty much activate their parasympathetic nervous system. So, um, there's lots of information around that. And again, I'm going to leave that from my husband's interview because he's such a great expert at talking about that. Um, but I, you know, I actually have a device that I just clip to my ear that stimulates, um, the nerves in my ear to go down into that part of my nervous system. And it will immediately put me in a calm state and help me sleep better. Um, but other things that you can do actually that activate that same function in the vagus nerve is body work. Um, like chiropractic adjustments do that massage, um, those kinds of like sensory input things will also calm the body, switch it from a sympathetic to a parasympathetic nervous system, um, deep breathing, particularly exhaling more CO2 than letting in oxygen. So, you know, there's all these really great ways where we can access our own body. Um, you know, gargling water is like one of the really popular ones, um, humming loudly. So, He'll get into all the neurology about that, but these are things that um, have to do with ways that we can access our body to shift the experience we're having neurologically or biochemically. And um, it goes both ways. Like, well, I think a lot of times people think that their body is just there, like responding to the brain as the master control. Um, but if, you know, we can do things to our body or our energy centers that will then have a really calming or positive impact on our brain and our hormones and our immune system as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So honing back into Hashimoto's as we wrap up, I, before we got on the call, you, you spoke briefly about your mother who uh, was treated for hypothyroid, but actually had Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, uh, and we do know that statistically Hashimoto's is very common. Uh, what would be some symptoms of someone that has Hashimoto's or maybe, maybe doesn't know it or is being treated, uh, incorrectly. Yeah. Um, totally. So with Hashimoto's, um, you know, it's a really interesting progression as things go because you can experience such a broad range of symptoms. Um, and in particular the thing, so what I had described to you earlier about the immune system kind of attacking friendly, you know, friendly fire on your own tissue um, this is where somebody in particular with Hashimoto's will experience a range of thyroid um, symptoms. And, you know, it's often called like the Hashimoto's roller coaster because what happens is um, when your body starts to create antibodies to your thyroid and, you, you know, any sort of inflammation in your body, whether it's just stress or like you get a cold or something, um, will cause an attack on that tissue. What happens when 
the thyroid gets attacked is the thyroid kind of spills out, like the, the cells get destroyed and the thyroid hormone spills out. And if you think about thyroid hormone, it's almost like gasoline, like it'll fuel our cells. It, it just like lights the fire of our metabolism, right? So when we have this huge gasoline spill, all of a sudden we'll have like this um, big fire of energy in our body. And you can think of that as like a hyperthyroid presentation. So people will get really energetic. They, they get like kind of anxious. They can get tremors. Um, they, they, they present with hyperthyroid symptoms because they have this spill of thyroid hormone from that autoimmune attack. And they'll, they'll, like sometimes people feel great. They're like, I, I didn't have to eat breakfast. I worked through the day. I got so much done. You know, I still feel great. Um, and and they, they kind of have this like flush of energy. And then what happens is when that gasoline gets burned up, they have a massive crash and they go into a hypothyroid state, which is like really tired, basically. Like you can't even open your eyes or get out of bed. Sometimes going up the stairs or walking to the bathroom is just like, why am I so tired? So sometimes, you know, that's a common presentation of like early um, autoimmune, particularly early Hashimoto's is just this like inconsistency of energy where sometimes people are like, Oh, I can just like, <clears throat> excuse me. I, um, I can get so much done. I, you know, I like work, 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 and I feel great. And I can go out with my friends after, and I'm just energized. And then like a week or two later, I can't even move my muscles. Like I feel so exhausted. So that's kind of the extremes of that, that roller coaster. If the Hashimoto's is unchecked and unmanaged will continue. Right. But the peaks will be like, lower, the peaks will be lower, and then the dips will be even lower because your thyroid can repair, but only to a certain degree and only so many times. So as you, you keep repairing to get back to a normal thyroid level, and then you have another hyper peak where you spill out hormone, and then you go again. So what ends up happening with a lot of Hashimoto's patients is they don't seek help or testing or, or care until they're so in the ditch of hypothyroidism that they're just like, why am I tired all the time now? This used to just be a couple days or a week, and then I would recover. It ends up being so much damage to the thyroid that they're just on the low end of the roller coaster. Um, and that's when they go in, their doctor generally will test their TSH, see that their TSH is super high and say, oh, okay, here's some, you know, thyroid hormone or, um, so without investigating if that was an autoimmune progression that happened over time, um, you don't know. You can't, you know, you're not treating it as an immune issue. You're just kind of saying, here, just take some thyroid hormone. So unfortunately, that's what happened to my mom. I mean, she had symptoms like over and over and then um, eventually just went to the doctor and they put her on Synthroid and kept her on Synthroid for like 40 years. And it was when I was getting my doctorate and I was learning about the immune system and about the thyroid. And I didn't even know I had Hashimoto's. I thought I was feeling great. And I ran the blood work on myself to see what a healthy person looked like um, so that I could learn from it to use later. Um, my thyroid antibodies were through the roof. And that was shocking to me. And, and it was shocking. It was really upsetting, but I'm also like so blessed that I did run it and I did catch it before that roller coaster, you know, kind of put me in a place where I'm like, I need to go investigate why I feel tired all the time. So, um, that's something that I think happens a lot for people with Hashimoto's is they're, ha they have inconsistent energy. Um, often they'll, they'll, they may have labeled themselves or somebody else may have labeled them with chronic fatigue where, it's just like, it's like an energy issue, right? Or a mood issue where there's anxiety and there's depression because all of these things fluctuate as our thyroid hormone fluctuates. Um, so unfortunately, like a lot of people experience those things. And unfortunately, a lot of people have thyroid imbalance. So, you know, I think, I think it's really important that everyone do a full thyroid panel. Like they, they test not just TSH, T4, but all the markers, like there's 11 of them and, and the antibodies and see if it's, if it's this early part of this roller coaster that's happening for them. So um, that's something major that I know happens for autoimmune, um, particularly Hashimoto's people. And another thing is um, 
just like mucus membrane inflammation. So people who have gut issues, who have seasonal allergies, I had the worst allergies growing up. That's like a pop a Claritin every day because it was just like, oh, I'm allergic to dust. I'm allergic to the whatever's in the air. Um, that's mucous membrane inflammation. So if it's coming from an immune dysregulation, you have to think about all the mucous membranes, like our lungs, our, our throat, our, our nasal passages, our gut is all lined with mucous membranes. So when that's all inflamed um, because of this chronic immune response, we're going to have things like seasonal allergies, like badly. We're going to, we're going to, I was, I was told I had asthma. I don't have asthma. I had inflammation of my lungs all through my childhood. Um, when I changed my diet, changed my lifestyle, removed all the triggering factors, I never get allergies anymore. Never like not seasonally, not to anything. I don't have asthma. I don't have wheezing anymore. I don't have skin breakouts, rashes, acne, all those things cleared up. So these are all things that were written off as like you're a teenager or, Hey, everybody has allergies. And it wasn't, it was, I was having an immune attack on my own body. So these are things that I think, unfortunately, people aren't connecting necessarily to Hashimoto's. Um, it's not to say it's the only reason, like Hashimoto's isn't always the reason you have allergies, but it, it was for me, it can be for a lot of people because they're all mucous membranes. And um, yeah, so that, the roller coaster, the anxiety, the depression, the mucus buildup in the body, um, those are all different things that can happen. Um, fatigue, a lot of people are written off as chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia because they have inflamed, um, achy muscles. Okay. Thank you for outlining that. So for our viewers at home that are like, okay, I want to get tested. And my doctor has only ever tested my TSH. What do you recommend they ask the doctor to test them for to get this picture sorted? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, when I talk to people like I, I actually have like a mind body thyroid club where I give people these resources of like, this is what you should ask your doctor for. Um, these are the, ta you know, and, and it's hard. I mean, sometimes you really have to advocate for yourself. I know that, um, sometimes it feels hard, especially if you're not one to speak up and you kind of want to like respect the doctor or you want to trust. Sorry, the, can I have my test? <laughs> <laughs> that typical yeah, exactly. Hashimoto's Sorry, person. You <laughs> test? Um, <laughs> but I think it's really important to push and advocate for that. So the full thyroid panel. Um, and you know, I have this written on, um, my site too. If people really want this information, they can reach out to me, but it's, um, TSH, which is the standard one, total T4 and free T4, total T3 and free T3, reverse T3, T3 uptake, and the two Hashimoto's antibodies, which are TPO and anti-TG. Um, and then if there's a suspicion of Graves autoimmune, which is hyperthyroid autoimmune, um, than those, the Graves antibodies as well. So like the TSI antibodies. So that in and of itself is like a good, I don't know, 10 markers. If you can get your doctor to run five of them, like that's better than just TSH. Um, and so it's important to advocate and really insist that the, all those are run at least once. You want to at least once run your antibodies and make sure that those are within normal limits. And then the, the follow-up tests, you know, unless you have some major change in your health or your life, you can run a smaller thyroid panel to check up on it. Um, but that, and, you know, comprehensively, it is, it's really important to look at other markers too, like vitamin D and look at inflammatory markers like homocysteine, ESR, um, C-reactive protein, um, you know, look at nutritional levels of zinc and, um, all these things like selenium, super important for thyroid health. So, B vitamins, you know, when I run a, an initial test on someone, it's, it's all of these things. It's their liver markers, it's their electrolytes. So advocating for a full kind of wellness panel, I think is really valuable. If your GP won't do that, at least try to get the full thyroid panel. If they won't do that, you know, I think it's time to look for a different doctor. Um, and often, if you find somebody who practices functional medicine or in the functional medicine realm, they will run those markers. Um, the wonderful thing that's happening thanks to technology is a lot of these tests you can order yourself and you can even run at home. Um, sometimes even with a finger prick blood test, um, there's a lot of different companies. I know you guys are in a different country than me, so it's hard to 
talk specifically about that, but you know, all over the world, I know I've worked with clients coaching them in, in England and, um, in, in the UK and in Europe and different areas, they, they have at home tests. So it is possible if, if you get a no, you know, from your doc, I, I would say to keep advocating for yourself or looking for a different doctor or a different place where you can order these yourself. Um, but there's, there's a lot of places where you can get this information now, so, which is really great. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all of this. I really hope um, to all our listeners that are listening to this that you've perhaps got a different side of um, autoimmune disease and Hashimoto's and anything relating to your thyroid that this is could be an undiscovered area that in your life that you haven't looked at. And there's some, obviously, you've got thousands of, I'm assuming, people you've worked with and seen amazing results. So 100% dive in to look at this aspect of the mind-body connection. And um, yeah, let's um, get this message out there because I really... I really believe in it and I think, yeah, it can really make a huge difference in people's lives. If someone was to look um, and they're like, hey, I'd love to get tested and work with someone like yourself. Do you do remote um, like consultations? Do you, yeah, are you currently absolutely. Taking patients? I do consultations remotely. I have um, online coaching and, you know, generally I work with people who identify as sensitive people because it's, it's harder to navigate health stuff when you're sensitive, when you're in your own body, when you're emotionally sensitive. Um, and because I've been through that journey, um, I know that it, it takes a different approach. It's not as easy as just kind of giving someone like a protocol and saying, okay, go and do this yourself because there's a lot of like processing and an, an emotional experience around that too. So I love working with people through that process. And, um, I had mentioned to you before we started this call too, is just the idea of balancing the way that you go about your healthcare and you go about looking at, um, holistic health. Um, and I use, I love the metaphor of the Chinese medicine, yin yang, and it's this, you know, the black and white, and there's a little bit of each energy on both sides, but they're opposite, but balancing forces. And when we look at, um, kind of the traditional way of going about healthcare, it's very young energy. It's, um, testing for stuff. It's like changing your diet lifestyle. These, these very kind of like investigative, diagnostic, data, logic driven things, which are very powerful, very important. Um, and it's all about taking action kind of like through will, right? And I think that that's very important, but that's a lot of things that people explore. A lot of what I'm talking about, the mind body side is more the yin side of the medicine as well, where it's about receiving, um, and trusting, surrendering, tapping into our own intuition and our innate wisdom. And so that involves a lot more things like narrative medicine, where it's about going through a person's story, which takes a lot of more time than just like writing a prescription, right? Um, digging into traumas, releasing energy from the body, um, touch as medicine, using things like that. So I think it's important that people, you know, maybe they've mastered that yang side and they still feel like, oh, I, I'm not getting results. I encourage them to look at things that are more about letting go and surrendering, um, and, and more about intuitive medicine and vice versa. If you've only tried that stuff, I think it's a really good idea to get some really advanced testing and do some functional medicine and, and dig a little deeper to balance your health as a whole. Wonderful. Thank you. And how can our viewers get in touch with you either on social media or a website? Where can yeah. They find you? Um, yeah, I have, you know, my social is Dr. Natasha F. Um, so it was my website and, um, yeah, it's just the, the sensitive doctor. That's kind of like who I love talking to and, um, communicating with people so they can find me at Dr. Natasha F, um, on Instagram, Facebook, on my website. And yeah, I love connecting with kindred spirits and people who have like a similar journey and a similar soul. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for so sharing good. with us today. We loved it. And you've definitely opened up a whole new perspective on viewing wellness, which we really appreciate. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. What an amazing episode. I certainly got a lot out of it and would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Is there a mind body connection? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is it an effective treatment strategy for autoimmune disease and particular Hashimoto's? Anyway, comment away. Let us know. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. That really helps get the podcast out and the like button. If you disliked it, you know what to do. And the notification bell, because we love to get this life-changing content out to as many people as possible. So don't miss out. Do all those things and we'll see you next episode.